All right. Let's just wait a bit for a couple more people to come in. Um, all right, here we go. So, hey everyone, welcome to our Future Peds Residents um, New York Regional Webinar as part of our six part regional webinar series. Welcome to the program leadership attending and welcome to all applicants. I am Lemya Mohammed. I am an IMG graduate from Sudan, a PEDS Match 22 applicant and one of the future PEDS resident equity manager. Um, how breakout rooms work is that each of our five program leadership will be given five minutes to reflect program highlights. At the two minute mark, I will give a subtle and gentle warning. Uh, then we will have designated time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, use our hashtag, um, hashtag FuturePeds Residence Webinar, New York Region, or use the chat box below. Are you going to start a timer when I go, or I just get to go? <laughs> I'll, I'll start right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, should I get started? Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Molly Broder. I'm the Associate Program Director at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, and I'm also here uh, with my colleague, uh, Sandra Berganza, who is the Program Director for our Social Pediatrics Training Program at CHAM. Um, Dr. McCabe could not join us tonight because it's her son's birthday, so she is celebrating with her son, but sends, sends her regards. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our categorical program before handing it over to Sandra to tell you about our, our um, social peds program. Our mission at CHAM is to train exceptional pediatricians who are going to strengthen the field of pediatrics and be advocates for all children in the communities they serve. We are located in the Bronx, so we're the northernmost and the only land um, the only land based of the five boroughs of New York City, all the rest of them are islands. Uh, many parts of the Bronx are significantly medically underserved and Montefiore health system as a whole and CHAM within that is really dedicated to delivering world-class care to our community. We strive to have a training program that is challenging and supportive for our residents, um, committed to teaching graduated autonomy and, and critical thinking. So that way, when you graduate from our program, you are prepared to practice on your own or to start your, your fellowship. We have two campuses where our residents rotate. One is in the north um, central part of the Bronx. That's where the Children's Hospital is. Uh, and the other one is the Weiler campus, uh, which is kind of in the central part of the Bronx, very close to Albert Einstein College of Medicine, um, for those of you who are familiar with that. And that is where our nursery and NICU rotations are. Both campuses are accessible by subway and bus and have parking for those who are choosing to drive. Um, we are pretty excited because we just did a huge update to our curriculum this year and we have switched over to an academic half day. Um, so that is on Thursday afternoons and that has allowed us to really um, have a mix of content in addition to the American Board of Pediatrics content that we, um, we will teach you guys. We also have um, uh, curriculum that are interspersed in there, such as our parade curriculum. That is a resident design curriculum that focuses on social determinants of health, advocacy, and anti-racism training. I did also wanna highlight our leader committee, uh, which was a committee that was started back in 2015, focusing on creating an environment that is diverse and inclusive and has a number of subcommittees to work on that, uh, which focus on recruitment, mentorship, retention, education, and community partnership. And with that, I will hand it over to Sandra. Thank you, Molly, and welcome. Welcome to all our students. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening to talk about our training opportunities here at, at, at CHAM. And as Dr. Broder mentioned, um, we do have a, a smaller program at, at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore called the Social Pediatrics Program. Uh, it is very well integrated into all the clinical and research and teaching activities at CHAM, but it is a separate match from the larger program. So we have four interns per year. So we have a total of 12 residents. And really with a stronger emphasis on training on um, urban underserved populations. So we actually, are, our primary care outpatient training site is located at a fairly qualified health center located in the South Bronx, um, but it serves the poorest congressional district of the United States. Um, so we're really uh, helping families and caring for families in a really underserved um, setting. So we have an enhanced advocacy curriculum, which all our residents participate. We really spend more time in the longitudinal advocacy 
advocacy curriculum during their second and third year, uh, really learning more com about individual advocacy, community advocacy, as well as legislative advocacy activities. Uh, our residents really participate in a really robust research program as well, and all have really accomplished uh, projects at the end of their research and all go on to do wonderful presentations from the work that they do with us. And we love talking about our, our graduates because our graduates in, in the categorical and the social peds program go on to do ver so many different exciting career paths um, from doing general pediatrics in, in academic careers and fellowships as well in subspecialties and really train in all different subspecialties in the area as well as across the nation. And we're so always incredibly proud of our graduates. Um, so with that, I uh, will happy to answer both my Molly and I will happy to answer any questions about um, CHAM and I'll pass it on to the next person before I get my one minute time up. So we are running out of time for the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, but we'll be lucky because we have a couple of questions coming in later um, and the program leadership can answer. Hi, good evening. Um, so my name is Heather Howell. I am the residency program director at NYU, and we're really excited to be here tonight. I'm gonna just share a couple big picture facts about our program and then turn it over to one of our chief residents. Um, so we are located in the heart of New York City. We're on the east side of Manhattan, um, and we're a medium-sized program. So we have 58 total residents and three chief residents. Um, we have 18 categorical residents per year, and then two child neuro residents who spend their first two years with us. And our training program is unique in that our residents split their time 50-50 between two different hospitals. Um, and these hospitals are located just a few blocks away from each other on First Avenue. So Bellevue Hospital um, is one of the, it is the oldest public hospital in the country. Um, and it's the heart of the New York City public hospital system, um, which is made up of 11 hospitals. Uh, and Bellevue has a rich, fascinating history and has always kept true to its mission of providing the best care to patients regardless of ability to pay. And our residents do their continuity clinics at Bellevue and also rotate on the inpatient services. The other 50% of their clinical time, they're at Hassenfeld Children's Hospital at NYU Langone Health, um, which is a rigorous academic hospital that cares for medically complex patients. Hassenfeld opened in 2018, so relatively new for us and both our patient volume and our faculty have grown immensely over the past few years. And these two clinical experiences really complement one another and provide broad training. And then I'm just lastly going to mention um, some highlights from our curriculum. So we have an immersion or X plus Y schedule. Um, we were one of the five initial programs in the country, pediatric programs, to um, have such a schedule. And it's been a really big success for us. Um, we have an academic half day for um, many years. And our residents have uh, three hours of protected time um, together to focus on learning. And that also has helped a lot with community building and the cohesiveness of our program. And our residents are the absolute greatest strength of our program. And they're a super impressive crew that I'm very fortunate to work with. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to one of our chiefs, Stefan Breitling. Hi everybody, uh, my name's Stefan. I'm one of the chiefs uh, at NYU. Um, I was just gonna kind of run through briefly kind of the three top reasons that I probably, that we hear about from our current residents as to kind of why they picked NYU or what their favorite parts about NYU are. Um, the first one, and I think most consistently across everybody is just is Bellevue and that fact that we get to be at Bellevue, um, the flagship hospital in the New York City public hospital system, um, getting to work with underserved patients from across the city, um, a huge immigrant population. Um, there's you know an incredible diversity of languages that are spoken. Um, so many different times I've had to get interpreters for languages I've never heard of before. Um, and so it's just an incredible opportunity to care for a great population that really trusts Bellevue um, because it's been around so long and been serving those populations for so long. Um, the second thing I would say that I really highlight is our schedule and the way that that impacts resident wellness. So that X plus Y means that we have, um, you are kind of alternating between inpatient and outpatient and it's four weeks on each, which means that you never have these long stretches where you're doing oh, three months of ICU in a row um, and never seeing the light of day. Um, and so I think people really, really appreciate that. Um, that also lets us have this consistent academic half day as well, um, which has led into, I think, the third uh, thing that we really like, um, which is the program culture. Um, 
everybody is extremely close. People are actually friends inside and outside the hospital. It's like getting to go to work with your friends every day. Um, after our half days on Friday evenings, we all uh, go to happy hour. And that's like probably one of the biggest program highlights for everybody. So thanks for listening. All right, that was actually one minute in advance. <laughs> so our next program is uh, Joseph Sanzari Children's Hospital. Hello, everybody. I am Sue Watson. I'm the program director at Hackensack. Um, we are, I guess, a children's hospital, a freestanding children's hospital, but tied in linked to a large academic health center. Um, so it's really um, an opportunity to interact with residents and fellows from other specialties, as well as obviously the pediatric department. We are a very large children's hospital as in terms of the numbers of patients that come through our doors, very diverse. Um, as you're hearing, I think the whole region is probably uh, quite diverse. Um, we, in Bergen County, there's a population close to a million people and uh, they represent the global, global sort of citizenship. So um, again, many languages, a lot of use of the translator phones. We look for people who speak different languages. I have 12 different languages spoken amongst my residents. We are a small program, so we have eight per year. Um, so 24 total and one chief resident. And I find it really nice that all of our training is available right on campus, um, either in the hospital or in five ambulatory centers that are really within walking distance of the, the main hospital. So um, some people live right down the block and walk to work. Other people I've had live in the city and commute in. So there's a lot of choices in terms of lifestyle and where you like to um, go home to. Uh, I think we have a big emphasis on wellness. So we, our institution actually, the whole network, provides one wellness day per quarter for each resident to use as they need, uh, intended for medical, mental health, dental appointments, but you don't really have to let us know why you're using it. Um, and then each group gets to plan an off-campus wellness day. So they all look forward to that and they've done some really fun things. Um, our, our people, I think, um, feel like a family. There's, there's a large faculty. We have more than 100 uh, full-time faculty and there's a lot of interaction between faculty and residents. And I think there's a warmth that sort of permeates everything we do. It really does feel like family, which I think makes it a really nice learning environment. Our curriculum obviously um, focuses on the APP content specifications. We do an academic half day as well on Thursday afternoons, interestingly. Um, and we build a lot of other things into that. So our rattled program, which stands for resident as team teacher, leader, evaluator and diagnostician that runs for six sessions a year. Um, we have our residents who are on the community peds and advocacy rotations in the second and third year do presentations to the group as part of the academic half day. They do a windshield survey. They're paired with uh, another resident and they visit one of the local towns and ride around for several hours and then kind of report back what they found in terms of social determinants of health and obstacles to getting health care and whatever else that they might have come across in their time. Um, what else can I tell you? We had our first graduating class last year. I'm really proud of them. Um, I've been training residents, this is 29 years now, but um, Hackensack started an independent program in 2018. Hackensack itself has been training residents as part of the New Jersey Medical School program for 25 years before that, but this was our first graduating class. And I was very excited that they did really well. Five of them went into fellowships um, at really great places. Um, two wanted to do primary care. One has an appointment at Michigan State. She went back home uh, in general pediatrics. Another one moved to Dallas doing primary care and one is staying on as chief resident. So we don't push people in any direction. We really provide a solid foundation in both general peds and all the subspecialties. And then when people find their passion, we just kind of help them get to the next step in their careers. And I don't know how much time I've taken, but um, I guess maybe I'll stop now and then answer questions later on. Actually, you're right on the mark. So oh, perfect. Our next program is Rutgers. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the organizers to setting this up to give us the opportunity to share um, what we have in our program. Uh, I'm going to say some of the similar things that you've heard from the other program directors um, about the diversity. Um, I'm going to talk about diversity a little bit differently in that 20% um, of our time is actually spent at St. Barnabas Medical Center, not just our children's hospital, which is um, uh, a children hosp children's hospital within a general hospital. And what it does is uh, that St. Barnabas experience in Livingston, New Jersey is a suburb different from our um, underserved community that we have uh, locally. Uh, Beth Israel Medical Center, where we live, has been a cornerstone of the community for over a century and um, has grown with the community over time. But St. Barnabas um, Livingston is uh, a, a different population, more middle, upper middle class. The mode of delivery of care is different. For example, the inpatient service where the residents go, um, it's a 24 seven hospitalist model with private pediatricians also involved and a lot different dynamic that the residents get to see. And um, it'll help set them up for uh, future opportunities when they're out practicing. Uh, so that in addition to all the wonderful things that everyone else has described about being a program uh, geographically where we are. We have um, three main things that we focus on. Uh, patient safety, um, being part of the RWJ Barnabas healthcare system, uh, there was uh, an, initiative, an, an initiative that started about four or five years ago in which all 45,000 employees were educated on, on safety behaviors. And we do that for every uh, resident class that comes in. And these are, when you see a pediatrician um, that you're like, you know what, I wanna be like that guy or that woman, there's a opportunity to take these behaviors that we teach you and to be, be that when you finish or while you're training. Uh, secondly, in reducing healthcare disparities, um, again, we are supported by a, um, a healthcare system that has a, a program called Ending Racism. Uh, our health system has acknowledged that there is systemic racism and our CEO from the very top of the system down to all the individual hospitals have made a commitment to making change. So that's a new initiative that started um, or late last year. And we're always seeing new things uh, come up as a result of that. Our um, program participated in an ACGME healthcare disparity reduction um, program, which was one of nine centers in the, in the country to contribute to the ACGME about what are ways to um, help reduce disparities and also leave behind um, a methodology of doing so for, for other um, institutions. So this was house, housewide, not just pediatrics, but we participated as well with having residents attend conferences there. And our selection process is, has always been holistic. So this isn't going to be too new for us. Our house staff um, exceed the um, underrepresented populations in pediatrics. So um, I think some numbers are 12 to 17% um, uh, underrepresented for the pediatric workforce. And we have about 40 to 50% of our residents are underrepresented, uh, come from under, underrepresented minority groups. So we really take a, a close hard look at each individual um, that we choose to interview. Um, we wanna see folks that are willing to grow and um, and so if there's bumps along the way, um, we are able to uh, give you an opportunity to join our family. Um, lots of other opportunities exist uh, that um, will place you coast to coast um, in a fellowship or a practice. And um, our website highlights where you can have, um, where you can see where our past classes have gone. And so I feel like we do, um, serve learners uh, really well um, in that regard. And then of course, resident well-being is a, uh, it's a particular interest of mine. Um, I sit on the, uh, the rec I'm the chair of the Rutgers Wellness Committee. So, you know, it'd be kind of uh, hypocritical if I didn't uh, walk the walk 
products and uh, we do make things at a large uh, health, excuse me, residency system-wide uh, changes as well as locally. So opportunities exist to very actively participate in all of that. Um, having said that, I'm going to pause here and um, wait for my turn during the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Keaton. And our, for our final program, um, actually, I think that's about it. Um, so we have a bunch of questions coming nope, in. From no, nope, it's not it. You skipped my program. Westchester Medical Center was the second one. You okay, skipped over me. <laughs> so we have Dr. Matt here. Um, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Kapklein. I'm the program director at uh, Westchester Medical Center, Maria Ferrari Children's Hospital in uh, beautiful Valhalla, New York, home of the gods. Um, the, uh, I, I'm going to try and keep it brief because I think the more fun part of this is, uh, is the, the questions. Um, so we are a medium-sized program. My residents' favorite part of the program is each other. Uh, when asked what they like best about the program, by far the most common response is uh, the, the people they work with, uh, which makes me really happy. We have a very positive uh, program culture here. It's mutually supportive. It stresses ownership um, and mutual support. And uh, it's my favorite thing about coming to work every day. My second favorite thing about coming to work every day is the patients that we get to take care of. Um, we are just north of New York City in Westchester, and we kind of get the both best of both worlds due to that uh, location. We've got a big, big catchment area similar to the upstate programs of the entire Hudson Valley. Almost 3 million people live there. Um, and uh, in that uh, area, we see uh, people who live in urban environments, people who live in rural environments, and everything in between migrant workers, new immigrants, refugees, a large Hasidic Jewish population. It really is the best thing about working here. Um, and along with that diversity of different kinds of folks from different kinds of backgrounds comes a big diversity of pathology. We have a, a really remarkable uh, diversity of pathology here, ranging from the previously undescribed to the bread and butter. And it makes coming to work every day a, a lot of fun. Um, the, um, the, our location uh, is nice because my residents get to enjoy uh, New York City, which is uh, a quick train ride or a quick uh, drive away. Uh, I'm about 35 minutes from Midtown Manhattan, and they also get to enjoy the natural beauty of the Hudson Valley, which is really nice. Lots of parks, lots of places to bike ride. I'm an avid cyclist, and I get to do that all the time here, including biking to work from my home in the Bronx, which is, which is great. Um, the, uh, our facility is a physically lovely, uh, children's hospital that looks like a giant dollhouse. Um, and, uh, it is attached to a, uh, quaternary care medical center, uh, that, uh, is a nice place to come to work every day. You get to pass the big aquariums in the lobby and the artwork by kids on the walls. And it, it feels like a children's hospital. Actually, it doesn't feel that much like a hospital at all, actually. Um, the uh, couple highlights of our program that you should know about, um, as with all the other programs you've been hearing about, we have an extensive diversity curriculum. Uh, we have a resident diversity committee, an anti-racism diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, a health uh, uh, healthcare disparities curriculum. Um, we have an extensive resident wellness program uh, that includes both uh, things built into the curriculum and side activities uh, outside the regular curriculum. Um, we, uh, I, if you were going to remember two things that perhaps we do a little differently from everybody else, uh, one would be that we take a highly individualized approach to resident education. We do not um, have tracks. Um, all of our residents design their own individual curricula, uh, which sometimes means they design their own rotations, which I encourage them to do, uh, and which is a lot of fun. Uh, and our residents often do things that nobody else has done before and go interesting places, uh, particularly during their second and third year. Um, you also should know that we, uh, I saw one, one program, I think it was, uh, um, uh, Dr. Matone said uh, her residents don't do any 24-hour call. My residents do only 24-hour call. Uh, so you have something to choose from. Uh, we do. We eliminated shift work as soon as we could. We did not think it was a good fit for our program. My residents really love their 24-hour calls, and they especially love their 
post call days, which they would be happy to talk to you about. We think we try to take an evidence based approach to call and resident learning, and we think that is the best solution, at least for us. Um, and uh, you should know that uh, my residents, about two thirds of them, go on to fellowship. Uh, they come from all over the country uh, and sometimes outside the country and they go all over the country when they finish. We do really well in fellowship matches uh, and we train people to become outstanding pediatricians, but so do all of the other programs that you've heard from today. So I'm going to shut up so uh, we can get to your questions, which I think is the more interesting part anyway. I mean, that was right on par. I was going to stop you anyway. So um, we have a bunch of questions coming in from the chat box and Twitter. The first one is, I'll just throw that to, um, to be honest, any program leadership that wishes to answer. Um, any advice for the upcoming virtual interview season? I got tons of advice. I could talk about that for an hour, but I probably shouldn't do that. My main piece of advice is be honest with yourself about what you're looking for and be honest with other programs about who you are. Um, the way the match works best is if programs know what they are getting in terms of applicants and applicants know what they're getting in terms of programs. No program wants a resident who's going to be unhappy with what they get. So you are best off being honest with yourself about what you're looking for. And um, if you aren't really interested in research, don't pretend to be interested in research by asking questions about it on your interview day. If what you care about is um, where the residents live and what the relationship is like between them, that's what you should ask about and that's what you should stress. Um, I, I, really, I really think that this whole system works best when everybody is honest with each other. I'll stop there. Right, can I add one thing to what Matt said? Um, I think as, as he said is truly correct that you will get a great pediatric training wherever it is that you go. And so um, don't forget to think about the other things outside of training that are really important to you that you're gonna wanna, that are gonna support you over the next three years. Um, so if it's important to you to be close to family, then keep that in mind when you are looking at programs. If you are in your happy place when you are skiing, um, then perhaps you wanna look at places where you're gonna be able to ski when you are not working um, or, you know, things like that. I think it's it's really important to consider how everything else about your environment is going to to support you during three years, because it's going to be a long three years. Life happens in three years. And so you want to be uh, best supported as, as you can wherever you go. I'll make a quick comment on the holistic thing. And just to kind of echo um, what's been said, it's a lot about like finding a good fit for you. And I think that's what we're doing when we're looking at your applications. We're looking at all of it. Like we really do. We read all the letters. We read your personal statements. We look a lot at the miss fees because those help us get to know who you are. And, and so we can kind of figure out if that's a good fit for us, so. All right, our next question, um, things to consider when choosing programs to apply for. And I'll, again, I'll just leave that open here. Um, I can uh, try to take a stab at this one. You know, there are, as the programs um, have described, such a huge uh, diversity. I trained at a program in which we didn't have fellows, so I got to work directly with faculty. And the program I happen to be um, leading is similar in that regard, that you get to work with faculty directly. Uh, we have one um, emergency medicine fellowship program. And so if, if that's something that um, appeals to you, um, then you should really uh, consider that because when you have a program or a, excuse me, a department in which they can't recruit their own fellows, then we come from different places and we're able to provide different opportunities when you're looking for fellowships or jobs, et cetera. Um, so just my two cents on that. A lot, lot of it is the obvious stuff, location, size. I mean, are you comfortable in bigger groups? Are you comfortable in smaller groups? There's a very different vibe to a program with 30 residents per class than there is in a re program with eight residents per class. It feels very different. So uh, some of this you may know about yourself already. It's, it's really hard to maintain accreditation of a residency program. I mean, none of the program directors who are talking to you tonight, tonight 
don't work really hard and maintain very high standards for themselves. You're going to get good training everywhere. You're going to come out a good pediatrician everywhere. Think about what's personally important to you. And, and as you go through your journey and start seeing more programs, you will start realizing that some things are more important to you than other things, and that's fine. All right, um, this is an interesting question. How does the diversity of residents within your program match with the diversity of the patient population your program serves? I'll let you um, answer that, Dr. Matt. <laughs> okay, I'll give, I'll give a shot to that one. Um, I would say it's different. Um, first of all, the, um, the, in New York City, and, and the, the, you know, Heather and Molly uh, can correct me if this is wrong, but the impression that, that I get from most of the in New York City programs, like I trained, I, I trained at Mount Sinai, um, a lot of their residents come from the greater New York area. New York, New York area tends to, to keep people in it. A lot of people are specifically attracted to it. I think that when you get out into the burbs, like my program and, and the, the Jersey programs, you start seeing a little more geographic diversity in your residents because some people, you know, might, if you're coming from Oklahoma um, or Northern California, like some of my residents are from, they may not be too psyched about going straight into living in Midtown Manhattan and might feel a little more comfortable, you know, living on the outskirts of the city. Um, so I would say I, I, I get, I have a lot of geographic diversity in my program. And obviously in my region, I don't have a lot of geographic diversity because they're all from my region. <laughs> um, but um, but a, lot, a lot of people come to the greater New York area from lots of different countries. Um, so uh, I guess I would say the, the kind of diversity I have within my program is a different kind of diversity than the kind of diversity I see among my patients. I think that's true. Um, I've had some people come from, you know, the Midwest and California who wanted to experience New York City, but didn't actually want to live in it. Um, one of them changed his mind after a year and actually moved to the city because he got comfortable with it. So I think it's a nice um, way you can jump over the river when you want to kind of be there and you can be in woods and lakes and beaches, you know, which Jersey has plenty of if you don't want that urban lifestyle. In terms of underrepresented minorities, um, we, we try very hard to mirror the population of New Jersey. And actually this year, our recruitment really put us even better than Jersey's diversity in terms of underrepresented minorities. So um, I think that, that gets to some of the questions I see popping up in the chat about how do you look at applicants? So we really kind of look very hard to find uh, a spectrum of applicants um, not necessarily just the ones with the highest test scores, but really people who have done important things who come from backgrounds that would enrich everybody else as they interact with them. Actually, the next question was about applicants. Um, this question is, uh, what makes an IMG applicant or a DO uh, stand out on an application if they are not the traditional fresh graduate high scores and visa status? I'll let you answer that, Dr. Susan. Um, you know, I, I don't think I look any differently at DO applicants. We have about 25% of our uh, cohort is DO. Um, and I think we've had a long history of kind of figuring out some of the DO schools and what kind of preparation those students have um, versus some of the newer ones, which I myself don't know as well. But I think it, it's really up to the individual I look at their personal statement, I see what makes them tick. I look at their letters, I look at their transcript, I kind of see what else they've done. So I, I don't know that there's anything particularly different uh, in how I look at a DO for an IMG applicant versus a UMG, USMG. I'll, I'll, I'll just help um, help out with some questions from the chat. There are some questions. There is a question if anyone, any programs have continuity clinics 
and talking about opportunities with advocacy training. Uh, you want to touch on those? I'll, I'll, I'll hit that one because our approach to continuity clinic is a little different from most other programs. We have our residents spread out among a variety of different continuity clinics. Um, ranging from hospital-based clinics to federally uh, qualified uh, community health centers to even private practices. Um, so when our residents come into the program, they actually get to pick and we try to match people with their with their interests. Um, I, I, and each each of these each of our sites are very different from each other. So the kinds of communities that they serve um, and the range of advocacy training that they get at those sites is going to differ a lot depending on the site. That being said, um, all, all of our residents do a required two weeks of community pediatrics and advocacy every year in their, in their training, which starts off as a standardized curriculum that everybody gets in the first year and then branches out um, in, the, um, in the second and third year to be more individualized topics depending on what the resident's area of interest is. When people talk about advocacy, I generally assume they're talking about group level advocacy because when you're talking about individual level advocacy, it's impossible to train in pediatrics and not become effective at individual level advocacy. That is that, that is the individual level advocacy is the core of our specialty. So, so when I hear advocacy, my brain generally goes to, to group level advocacy. I'll stop there, I'm doing too much talking. And I think students should know that every program has to have a continuity clinic. That's one of the requirements. So um, in our system, we only have one site um, with two faculty preceptors, one fluent in Korean, one fluent in Spanish. So that helps. And you're assigned a half day uh, in the first year. So if you're a Monday person, you're there every Monday afternoon, except when you're on nights or on vacation in the uh, second and third years, we excuse folks when they're on the critical care rotations, um, but otherwise you're you're there half or a whole day, pretty much throughout your three years of training. I'll mention ours is a little bit different too because of our immersion schedule. So our residents don't go to their continuity clinic when they're on an inpatient or a Y block, but they still do the same amount of continuity clinic as every other program in the country. We just do it um, in the, in the um, sorry, the, the X is the inpatient. They do it all in the Y block. So they do multiple half days over those four weeks. Um, and all of our continuity clinic is at Bellevue. And we have a really amazing core group of general pediatricians who've been practicing there for a long time. Um, and the residents all work together in that space, which is really, Really great. And I, I agree with what Matt says. I think they are advocating all the time. Like that's part of it, you know, with every individual patient sort of understanding like how um, to, to best help. And then we have a lot of opportunities as a program to do more group level advocacy. And we have scholarly pathways. So all of our categorical residents have um, protected time in their second and third year and they can pick a pathway and they, they work on projects. Um, so those are really different depending on your interests. All right. We have time for one last question. Um, I'll just leave that open. Uh, do residents get time for research or individual projects that they might be interested in? And what are the sources um, your program provides for uh, board preparation? So I can say for Hackensack, um, we encourage anybody who's thinking about fellowship certainly to get involved in research. It usually works that they turn one of their individualized curriculum blocks in the second year into a research block. And it's worked very well. They have time to pull data together and then submit something for presentation, either the spring of their second year or the fall of their third year. Um, and we have a research office, which is very supportive for both faculty and resident research. So the system works very well. We have um, board review one Friday morning each block. Um, but I really look at every day as kind of board prep, board review. I think you learn patient by patient. And um, I think the questions that you want to go through and all that stuff helps to sort of cement what you've been learning. But I think really reading about your patients and seeing lots and lots of different kinds of pathology really is the best board prep. Yeah, I'll say for NYU, we have um, kind of built in times each during people's clinic blocks for individual curriculum. Um, they usually have a couple half days a week. So that can be for either things you need to do in real life or to work on like any research that you have. People also can take a research block if they have like very specific um, research goals that they wanna meet over a certain deadline. Um, we also have a research pathway, um, 
but you don't have to be in that pathway to get research done. We have uh, a couple of great faculty who know a lot about all the research that's going on in our institution, which there's a lot and can really help pair um, residents even who aren't in the research pathway with research mentors um, who have similar interests in them. I'll chime in. Like Susan, uh, we offer individual blocks uh, of time, up to four or five of them per resident, uh, where they can do as much research as they want. So you can spend, you know, a, a, a one sixth of your residency doing research if that's what you feel like doing. Um, and for um, board prep, we do the usual uh, board review sessions for seniors in the spring. Our associate program director meets with all the residents to go over there and training score and de design individual study plans for them. And um, we take an individualized approach to that, like we do with everything. And we have a question back. I'll, I'll stop. All right. Thank you for the program leadership and all of the um, applicants attending. Um, don't forget to use our hashtag, hashtag Future Pete's Residence Webinar. If you have any questions, leave them on the uh, Twitter page and we'll thank you for attending today. Have Thanks fun with it, guys. Us. It's not like applying to medical school. <laughs> you, now have, you now have a marketable skill and people will be trying to attract you. Enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.